All right, hallelujah. Heavenly Father, we do thank you for all things. We do glorify and honor your holy name. Um, we, we do call upon you, Father, in the hour that we're living in, the late hour that we're living in, because we find ourselves in the same condition many, many times uh, in the hour that we're in now as our ancient people were. And we need uh, for you to open our understanding. We need our eyes of our understanding open um, because we know you're soon to come. And we need to be prepared for your coming because we know that nothing is going to enter into your kingdom unless it's without spot, wrinkle, and blemish. So help us. Give us your truth and your understanding. Speak to us your words of truth. In the mighty name of Jesus, amen. All right, well, we're back. Um, we're going to go ahead tonight, and we're going to um, um, start the series on... Um, Prayer and fasting. The prayer and fasting series because it's it's greatly needed. Um, you know, as I go out and I travel the country, um, trying to see who who even still has a spark of conviction left in their hearts uh, for the Most High, it's it's it's, it's hard for me to not notice the, the decline that's going on, especially in holiness. Um, there is just about little, if any, left at all of um, what we would call holiness left out there in this world. Um, I do thank the Father that we are one of the last staples um, of that, and I do greatly rejoice uh, in the King for that. I thank him because he's given us his Holy Spirit his Kadesh Ruah, um, Ruah Kadesh, so that we have an opportunity before he comes to, to live this life um, for him. Uh, so many people are squandering uh, the opportunity that's before us. And, and, and you know, th th this series is going to be a, a, a spirit, I mean, a, a series is going to bring conviction because when I read the scriptures um, and, and I I'm telling you I see I see the condition um, today following the same exact example as the people of old um, we're in a very sad state of affairs we're very lazy um, docile apathetic slothful people when it comes to our personal dedication to him and, and I'm hoping I know I'm not going to get many I already know this from the very beginning but I'm hoping um, that out of this particular series right here we can at least get maybe maybe at least two or three and I'm talking about at least two or three faithful people out of all the Israelites we know because I know how the human spirit does we hear this um, the scriptures and the teachings has become eye candy it's become mind candy. We, we hear the word, but there's very little performance to show that we've really truly have been convicted and that we really truly have been transformed by this word. And of course, as we see this, you're going you're gonna to see ourselves. We're, we're going to be able to see ourselves uh, clearly. Nobody's going to get by. And of course, the same way that the Most High judge then is the same way he judged now. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. And and most of us don't spend time in the scriptures even try to find out the way that we should be um, behaving, the way that we should be acting, how we should be as a people. We're so concerned about ourselves that that it leaves little concern for about him at all. And, you know, I mean, everything is all about me. What can I do to get me better? How about if you get a better relationship with the Father, then you can get better. I mean, that's just the fact. See, that's proper order and perspective. But like I said... You know, when I go out there, there's little, if any, resemblance of holiness left. I see the spirit of the world just creeping in on, on uh, even those who, who call themselves holy. It's, it's all over the place. It's just sad. It, it's literally sad. Um, and, and, it, and it saddens my heart that people do not have a great amount of love for the Father. I mean, all we want to do is all we want to do is be saved. We don't care about living nothing for him. We really truly don't care about having our minds transformed. We don't care about 
changing our character or changing our nature to please him. We're not trying to do anything um, that will advance the kingdom. And as evident by the lack of spiritual power um, that, that we have in the assembly. You know, we, we basically have a few people that, that have it, and everybody is pretty much uh, going off their coattails and leeching off of them and being counted in um, the hole. And it's just sad, um, considering what the apostles and what the prophets have already told us. Um, but there are two reasons why. And we're going to be talking about intercessory prayer. But there are two reasons why people do not do uh, or even dedicate themselves to intercessory prayer. Number one is very hard work. And you can't be a lazy person to do this. So that automatically knocks out 98% of Americans, especially those who, who um, call themselves Israelites. Um, you know, we don't like getting out of our comfort zone. Um, and it's just sad. But I hope tonight that uh, just by hearing the word, that the word would be able to bring some form of transformation. Because we're going to hear the same thing um, that our ancient people heard many, many centuries ago. And we're going to see the condition uh, of the minds of the prophets and how that they prayed and how that they talked uh, to the Most High uh, when they saw uh, this condition. Because I see this, the very same condition on the assembly today. I don't see any difference, none whatsoever at all. I wish I, I wish, I really truly wish that I, I could say that I actually uh, see a, uh, an assembly that's better than what I've saw from my ancient people, but I don't see it. I flat out don't see it. I'm just being honest. And, and we're going to see what the book says. And another reason why is, is because it's time consuming. Now, what is intercessory prayer? Well, it's the type of life um, that, that one will lead in order to have um, a deep relationship with the Father. And the expression of the actual prayer in itself, it comes from the depths of the soul, the depths of the heart. It's not because somebody's banging on the chair and crying out with the top of their voice or... Um, um, or using some type of outward expression like that in order to get a hold to the Father. Um, but it's a very sincere um, command um, that one soul must have for the word uh, of the Most High God. You must have a command for the scriptures. You must know what our ancient people did. You just can't uh, just go all feeling and emotions like we are so enticed to do um, in this um, European, Greco-Roman, abstract thinking society. Um, you've got to know the scriptures. And, of course, you know, I, I've got a saying that I've always said of old, um, that if you really, truly want to be transformed, spend some time in the book. And, I mean, really spend some time in the book. You, you'll be transformed. Um, so that lets you, some people will say, well, we spend time in the book, Pastor Dow. Yeah, but you spend time in a book to... Maybe fulfill your own lust, or maybe you got another desire or another motive or reason um, why you spend time there in the book. But if you're spending time in this book and yet there's no transformation of the inward and outward man, then your, your time is vanity. It's all vain. And that's just a literal fact. Um, and, of course, you know, growing up in captivity and being in captivity, we don't like talk like this because we've assimilated so much. Uh, that our, we wear our feelings on our sleeves. And, um, of course, most preachers are scared half to death to even say something to their congregations. I, I guess they need to actually come and take a lesson from one of the last pastors um, in this time, in this generation, um, before the king comes. Because it seemed like everybody else has done lost uh, what I call testicular fortitude in order to be able to stand up and be the man that Yah has called them to be everyone. If they don't do that, they either sell out because they're looking for the accolades or the praises of men or, or, or either they have uh, ambitions uh, with, with um, twinkling in their eyes for some type of worldly gain. Uh, whatever it is, it's, it's, we done lost the, the path and the mark as a whole today. And you watch the, the people today and see how when the word of the Most High Yahweh comes, um, you, you watch and see how disinterested we are in it. Um, you, you watch the function of people uh, when the word comes in. It. And um, I mean, I just got finished coming from a place where the pastor and his, his wife are beautiful people. But overall, as a whole, the people are in sad condition. Can you imagine um, Ezra 
or Nehemiah or Daniel uh, standing up in prayer for making intercession for Israel and the people would get up and just walk out on it. That's the condition that we find ourselves in today. And remember, the Messiah said, when he come, will he find faith on his earth? Will he? And I'm, I'm telling you, it's getting really scarce to find faith on this earth. I mean, really, truly scarce. And, and so the admonishment of the hour is, is you strive to enter in. Because if you don't, uh, somebody, I'll, I'll assure you that he has maybe one or two people somewhere that's doing what they can to enter in. Or the rest of the world is, is just going to um, follow the way of the masses. They're going to go in at the broad path. Yes, sir. And many are going that way. Prayer carries a lot of power. And, of course, you cannot really truly talk about prayer too much unless you talk about prayer and fasting. And fasting has almost become a, a cuss word in the American society today because our, our hearts and our spirit love so much to have it ease in Zion. We hate anything that causes us to feel or be uncomfortable because we have a displaced conscience. Our conscience uh, is, is, is not on the plumb line like it should be to let us know uh, the way we should function and how we should be thinking. Um, if he's your all in all, like we so, uh, like so many times we profess, um, then fasting wouldn't be that much of a, uh, an obstacle. It wouldn't be that much of a burden, especially when the center of attention and the focus is, is on him and him alone. You know, the apostles told us over and over again that everything that we do, especially when it comes to the body, that we ought to seek to edify we ought to seek that the other may be excelled, um, that, that they would, would, would come on up. And, and the sentiments of the gospel is, is after you have been converted, then you go and you strengthen your brother, and you look and see how little of that is, that is really truly going on in the hour that we're living in now. I mean, it's really little that's going on. So there's really truly not many warriors um, of the faith. There's a lot of talking. Sure, there's a, a plenty of talking, plenty of instruction, uh, but very, very, very little uh, doing of it. Um, in order to be effective in intercessory prayer, you cannot walk a, a life of carnality. And you can't have what you call um, ups, one minute, and downs the next because the most high hates a false balance. You must be consistent in your behavior. You, you, the, the seasons, you must be uh, consistent in seasons. And out of season. Um, because there are going to be seasons. If you live his life any amount of time, you know that there's going to be seasons. Um, uh, the very strength of a person that intercedes in, in prayer, they're not just using words or using words to fill up empty space. Um, uh, again, the prayer comes from right here. Um, and, and to give you an example, we're going to do an extensive amount of reading right here, and I'm not going to spend too much time um, doing too, too much instruction. I will be instructing as we read. We're going to go to Genesis, the 18th chapter. And for all you people that understand the modern Hebrew, uh, we're going to be in Embattashit, the 18th chapter, and we're going to start at the first verse. Now, make no mistake about it. Um, that my whole in, entire mission and, and job is to feed y'all's people with knowledge and understanding. And we cannot, the one thing I'm, I'm trying my best to make sure is when I stand before him, because my judgment is going to be greater than yours, but when I stand before him, uh, that I'm not going to be chargeable to any man to say that I've fell short when it comes to uh, the feeding of the Most High Yahweh's sheep and his lambs. Uh, because I work diligently and I work hard to not just throw together some um, sermon and stuff. I actually work diligently and work hard. I, I research. Um, I have to throw away a lot of bones in my research. I come across things, and it, that's why it's such a, a daunting task even just to um, um, bring forth a word today because there's so much with the available resources that we have today 
including the scriptures that are sitting in front of us, when there's so much influence from the Europeans on them that try to eschew um, the very intent and purpose of the Most High. There's a, there's, a, there's a mountain to climb every single time you, in order to bring forth this unadulterated, this, this uncompromised, this pure word. It really, truly is. Um, so I don't um, take it lightly. I, I'm not going to be, I'm not going to have the Father to say to me, why come you did not feed my sheep? Hallelujah. I'm looking for those words to be expounded to me uh, as from everyone who is really truly or who really truly loves the Father. I'm looking forward to hearing those words. Well done, now good and faithful servant. You've been faithful over a few things. So therefore, I'll make you master over a lot. Uh, Genesis 18, chapter starting at verse, first verse, it says, And Yahweh appeared unto him in the plains of Marim, and he sat in the tent door in the heat of the day. And he lifted up his eyes and looked, and lo, there stood, their men stood, uh, and lo, three men stood by him. And when he saw them, he ran to meet them at the tent of the door, and bowed himself towards the ground. And this is Abraham, okay? And said, and said, my Lord, if now, or my master, if now I have found favor in thy sight, pass not away. I pray thee from thy servant. Let a little water, I pray you, be fetched. And wash your feet and rest yourselves under the tree. And I will fetch a morsel of bread and comfort ye your hearts after that you pass on. For therefore are ye come to your servant. And they said, so do as thou hast said. And Abraham hastened to the tent of Sarah and said, make ready quickly three measures of fine meal needed. And make cakes upon the earth. And Abraham ran unto the herd and fetched a calf tender and good and gave it unto a young man and he hastened to dress it. And he took butter and milk and the calf which he had dressed and he set it before him and he stood by them under the tree and they did eat. And they said unto him, where is Sarah thy wife? Now, a few things here. You know, there's a lot of people today that's trying to expire to a, a vegetarian diet and stuff. It's amazing because you got the most high appearing to Abraham in the flesh along with two angels. And they're sitting here eating meat. All right, follow me. I just thought I'd bring it out because if I don't bring it out, we'll miss it. Okay? I just thought I'd bring it out. There's nothing wrong with eating a bunch of herbs and vegetables and stuff right here. But Abraham, the father of faith, chose to, to, to give the most high some bread and some meat. Hallelujah. Glory to the king. I understand that our environment is very toxic. And, and so, you know, you can't get, give them just any kind of meat. Hallelujah. Um, and as we can see, um, that Abraham was a shepherd. Hallelujah. He tended sheep, tended flocks and herds. The very thing that American society in Babylon is trying to do its best to make sure that we stay away from. The old paths and the old landmarks. And that's the reason why that you don't have a people that's really truly walking close to him today because we aspire to live after the heathens that are around about us. Hallelujah. Verse 9. And he said unto them, Where is Sarah thy wife? And he said, Behold, in the tent. And he said, I will certainly return unto thee according to the time of thy life. And lo, Sarah, thy wife shall have a son. And Sarah heard it in the tent door which was behind him. Now Abraham and Sarah were old. And well stricken in age, and it ceased to be with Sarah after the manner of women. Therefore Sarah laughed within herself, saying, I am wax old. Shall I have pleasure, my Lord, being old also? And Yahweh said unto Abraham, Wherefore did Sarah laugh, saying, Shall I of a surety bear a child which am old? Is anything too hard for Yahweh at the time appointed? Uh, I will return unto thee according to the time of the life, and Sarah shall have a son. And then Sarah denied the saying, I laugh not. For she was afraid, and she said, Nay. I mean, and he said, Nay, but thou didst laugh. And the men rose up from thence and looked towards Sodom, and Abraham went with them to bring them on the way. And Yahweh said, Shall I hide from Abraham the thing which I do? Seeing that Abraham shall surely become a great and mighty nation, and all the nations of the earth shall be blessed in him. For I know him, and he will command 
his children. Did y'all hear what the Most High Yah said to Abraham? He says, I know him, and I know that he will command his children. Now, when, when the Most High was meeting Abraham, and he had a, um, a, a meeting here, there's a bunch of things going on in this particular passage that uh, it's hard for us to even relate to today. Number one, Abraham was a free man. Um, he, he, he owned cattle and herds and, and flocks and stuff, and so he didn't have any master or lord or anybody lording over him. And, and as a, a free man, that means he could go and come as he pleased. Hallelujah. And, of course, you know, Abraham's children didn't have to grow up in a society to where they have the influence of heathenisms all around us like we do here in American society. Um, and and, and cause so, therefore, you know, the Most High knew that he would command his children because his children wouldn't have too much influences from external sources like we do today. Uh, you get children that can be raised up in this, and they love the way of the heathen. They just love it, aspire to it. Um, and, and, so, and, of course, when you're in captivity, see, this is what lets us know that we are in captivity. We're not in our homeland. We're not a free people. Uh, we've lost our culture, our heritage, our nationality. And we go around and acting just like these bastards, acting like these heathens and stuff, and refuse to be converted and stuff. How in the world do you expect to go into the holy kingdom with that kind of mindset? The refusal of being transformed. We have a, a heritage that we have to get back to. We have a way of thinking. We have things that must be restored in our conscience and mind before we can even inherit that holy kingdom. The book talks about Abraham from Genesis to Revelations and stuff, and we ignore him as a father figure when we can learn from him. We have a mindset that is cancerous. It's very cancerous. I mean, all of us. All of us have the residue of captivity on us. The sad part about it is, is when you're being told this, and even in being told, you still resist and fight against it. As if it doesn't even exist among us. Some of us choose to ignore it, some of us choose to see it. And of course, we'll see the perfection as the walk goes forth to those who really truly understand the words that are being said. Let's go back to the book. Verse 19, For I know him, for he will command his children and his household after him, and they shall... Uh, and they shall keep the way of Yahweh to do justice and judgment that Yahweh may bring upon Abraham that which he has spoken of him. And Yahweh said, because the cry of Sodom and Gomorrah is great and because their sin is very grievous, I will go down now and see whether they have done altogether according to the cry of it, which is come unto me. And if not, I will know. And the men turned their faces from thence and went towards Sodom. And Abraham stood yet before the Lord. And Abraham drew near and said, Wilt thou also destroy the righteous with the wicked? Did y'all hear the question? His concern was, and he's make no mistake, he's making intercession right now. Wilt thou destroy the righteous with the wicked? And I want to make a point right here. He just didn't stop at one plea. He knew how to pull. He knew how to tug on the Most High. He knew how to keep on asking and keep on asking until the Most High finally just told him that's enough. And Abraham drew near and said, Would thou destroy the righteous with the wicked preadventure? There be 50 righteous within the city. Notice, I'm sure it's a pretty big city. And, and we're on about 70 something miles on the outskirts of Nashville. That's a big city. Can you imagine Abraham? actually making a plea to the most high. He, he is on the outskirts of the city like we are today. And then he looks towards Sodom because he knows that they're going there. And he runs up to Yahweh and he asks him, he said, come on, if there's 50 righteous, if there's just 50, you know, 50 righteous, I mean, surely you will spare the city. That's a pretty low number to start at. What is amazing to me is that what makes us think that there are 50 righteous people dwelling in any city? We see the condition today worse than what it was back then. They didn't have all the influences of modern technology. They didn't have at a, at a, a click of a button perversion put in front of their eyes just like that. We are more wicked than Sodom and Gomorrah ever was. And look at the judgment that they got. That's why I tell you with confidence and conviction that America will be destroyed by fire. 
America is finished as a country as well as the rest of the nations because we have spewed our wicked, iniquitous, cancerous spirit throughout the whole earth. And all the earth aspires to be like this wicked country. And you know what makes this country wicked? More wicked than all other countries? Because there are people who claim to know the Most High Yahweh, and yet they live in other sheer wickedness. Workers of iniquity. That's what makes this country more wicked than every country on the face of planet Earth. Yes, sir. Yes, ma'am. Now, Abraham is making a plea for Sodom. All right? And he, he's down to 50. In verse 25, he says, Be it far from thee to do after the manner, to slay the righteous with the wicked, and that the righteous should be as the wicked, that be far from thee. Shall not the judge of all the earth do right? And Yahweh said, If I find in Sodom fifty righteous within the city, then I will spare all the place for their sakes. Notice, he said, I'm not going to spare just a, a, a little piece. Of, almost, I will spare every bit of it if there is 50 righteous in the city. I'm beginning to wonder. Are right, you following me? When you look at, let's go to Los Angeles. That is a huge city. That is a, a huge city. And I can almost guarantee you there ain't 50 righteous in that city. Oh, there may be thousands of people that call on him, but that doesn't make you righteous just because you call on him. Uh-oh. See, we better get this thing. Hallelujah. All right, let, let's go on here for a second. Let's see what the book says, all right? Verse 27, Abraham said, Abraham answered and said, Behold now, I have taken up on me to speak unto the Lord, which am but dust and ashes. You see how his humility, do you see his humility? Preadventure, there shall lack five of the fifty righteous. Will thou destroy all the city for lack of five? And he said, If I find there forty and five, I would not destroy it. And of course, we know the rest of the story. He kept on going. He kept on going and kept on going. But look at the long suffering of the Most High Yah. And look how patient he is towards his friend, Abraham. Is that not beautiful? With this in mind, without letting these things slip, do you think that the Most High Yah was going to spare America? When I travel from city to city to city and I see the conditioning worsening year after year after year after year after year. And who am I? That's what everybody would say. Who am I? Well, I'm nobody but just a servant. That's it. But I'm a servant of the Most High. And as a servant, that means I know his will. And I'm not praying thy will because I know his will. Am I making any sense? I know what his will is. Hallelujah. And so it behooves us that we would actually uh, pay attention, brothers and sisters. I'm not going to make any intercession for America because this country has if just a very, very few righteous left, if there are any, and none of them are Christians. I promise you that. Hallelujah. Uh, one of the strengths of, of being able to understand what it means to intercede in the scriptures is is, is, is that um, and you want to prepare to probably go to Ezra the ninth chapter okay uh, is, is that entire nations have been spared because one person interceded for that nation I didn't say many I said one person interceded one person had the spirit of the most high Yah dwelling in their hearts to call the people to repentance in order to call the nations to be saved. And the mighty acts of Yahweh are performed all throughout the scriptures right here. We see the miracles. We see why people have been delivered. Um, because of the people who feared him. And they would make intercession for his work. Now there's something that is required in us in order to stay Kodesh. Or meaning holy. We have to. And as old fashioned as most people may think that it is. We have to stay set apart. Holiness is being set apart for his 
use. It's not only in how you dress and how you look and carry yourself. It's actually being obedient and being set apart particularly for his use. And as believers, we're not permitted to mingle the holy seed with the heathens of America. We're not. We're, we're forbidden, if you understand what I mean. And even, even my own children. If my own children choose to go out and choose, to, choose some heathen and, and choose to mingle with them and stuff, I don't have nothing. Forget them. I'm not, I'm not going to be there. I ain't putting up with it, and I'm not going to do it. And they, damn soul ain't getting married here. The only way both of my children would get married is at my approval. Now, they can go get married. I can't stop them. Hey, do y'all hear what I said? But they're not going to be getting married to anybody that I don't approve of. Now, they can do it. Are you following me? But they're going to have to answer to the Father for that. Because I'm the type of man, I ain't, everybody else can be connected by feelings and emotions. I'm, I'm, I'm connected to the spirit, which spirit is thicker than blood. I'm more connected to the father and what he has to say. I, I, I love his way and, and his perspective a whole lot better than mine. Hallelujah. And old Pastor Dow ain't going to hell for nobody. Glory to the king. But we have to remember that we are in the dispersion. We are scattered as his children. Um, and hey, we're not to have fellowship with him. Now we can see throughout the scriptures where the Israelites would often go work. They would often go and buy meat and stuff like that. But then they, their communion and their fellowship was with the saints. Am I making any sense? And you've got to guard yourself, saints. You really truly do. You have to guard yourself. You have to guard your heart. And you have to do it with all diligence. Every single bit of it. Because your spirit is waiting to warm up to this world. Yeah, there's a spirit in man that's waiting to warm up to this world and to get real complacent. To make you try to think that you're not in hostile environment. That your soul is all right and stuff. But I don't see it that way. Not while we're in exile. And especially not while we're in our homeland. Am I making any sense? Do y'all notice how I talk different? Y'all notice that? Talk a lot different than a lot of preachers you would hear from. A whole lot, and I thank the Father for it. That's why they call you mad. But there's no way that we can, main, that we can remain Kadesh if we forsake the fellowship of the saints. You know, we always have something more important than coming to Scripture study. You know, life is going on, but something is more important than coming to hear the Torah read. I don't know what anything that is more important than that. Am I making sense? We, we can't keep the Shabbat because we got other things we have to do that's more important than, than, than to assemble with the saints. See how easy it is to um, go ahead and wax cold? Oh, yeah. Oh, hallelujah. We can't fall into to this dormant state. But we do find ourselves living in the same conditions today as our ancient ancestors old, and we are repeating the very same mistakes and living after the same false way. And um, we can learn something from the prophets because the prophets taught us how to repent as a people and how to repent as a nation. They did. Uh, and I don't want their words to fall on deaf ears. I really truly don't. But So we must read the scriptures in order to understand our condition today. See, today, we live in a time that they don't stone us because of the laws of this land, but they do speak evil against us. And they do stone us with their looks. Hallelujah. We live in a time where people resist the words of truth coming from this ministry. And I, you have to understand, I'm not concerned about the people out there. I'm talking about the people who, who sit right there and listen to me. At least they say they do. And you pay attention to the, the speech of people and see how they're so concerned about themselves and they never mention anything about him. Even when, even when they, we, we are praying for each other for deliverance, the focus is on me and not him. We don't want to get right because he's right and we want to please him because he's holy. We want to get right because we want to appease the situation and bring comfort to our little miserable world. In order for us to cope in it. And that's the reason why real true deliverance and soundness of mind and the integrity of heart is not there. It's missing. Because we're selfish. We're selfish as a people. 
And even after we get what we call all the deliveries and stuff, it doesn't last too long. Because we're out of order. And we're not putting him first and foremost. We're so concerned about everybody else serving him and we forgot about ourselves. Hallelujah. But today, you hear people, you watch people, when the truth comes forth, they'll shut their ears up and they don't want to hear the law because the iniquity of their heart has allowed their heart to be darkened and to reject and spurn his way. And so we do find ourselves in the same conditions. Hey, let me tell us all something. The Most High has given us a very long life to live. At least I think it's long. And there are not too many people concerned about living their days for him. It's all about me, my enjoyment, and my pleasure. And you can't have any lasting enjoyment and pleasure without him. See, the focus is all wrong. Do you know where this comes from? You know where this mindset comes from? It comes from having the residue of the flesh of the old man still with us. Still ever present with us. And that's why holiness is suffering today. Because Hebrews 12, 14 says, follow peace with all men and holiness. Set apart. Kodesh. Because without which no man is going to see the Father. And that is the truth. No man is going to see Yahweh. And I will show you the condition of the churches in his land right here. Uh, we get so-called saved and then we continue our little sinful lives and our wicked condition and we expect the wicked pride of our hearts to, to, to actually take us right on into his pure kingdom. Is that not so? Now, you see, we can get this understanding and you're going to hear you're going to hear what the prophet says. You're going to hear what the prophets of old had to say. Now, we can get this understanding like this, but I sit and watched it over this past weekend as I was preaching the, the, the truth of Yah's word. And I sit and watch people get restless. And when they had too much, they just got right on up and mosey on out the door. And of course, inside I was saying bye. Hallelujah. It doesn't trouble me one bit when somebody gets up and walk right on out the door. Hallelujah. I'm just amazed at how little value that people put on their soul. But I promise you they won't walk out of a movie theater. I promise you that. I guarantee you that. Hmm? I promise you that. I promise you that. That's just the truth. See how little value we put on ourselves? That's why somebody's got to love you more than you hate yourself. <clears throat> It's just the truth. So we need real true repentance. Because the king is coming soon. Y'all believe that? I believe that he's coming soon. I really truly do. Let's go over here to Ezra the ninth chapter. Let's do some reading here for a second, all right? Ezra the ninth chapter. We're going to read, all right? Now when these things were done, the princes came to me saying, The people of Israel and the priests and the Levites have not separated themselves from the people of the lands. What, what, what happened? They did, not separate they did not separate themselves from the people of the what? The lands. When did this change? Because we're in captivity? I mean, even, I, I would tell you right now that this has got to be one of the best captivities for us that there's ever has been. Because at least we can separate ourselves. And at least even, even at that, they even got laws on their book that even protect us so that we can even worship the way we want, at least for now. You know, things are getting ready to change since the so-called vicar of Christ stood up and declared Sunday to be the day of worship. Well, that's the day of worship of all you pagan Christians out there who ain't got no sense. But for us Israelites, I'll say the same thing that Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego, Judas, Maccabees, as well as the other righteous Israelites. This past ain't bowing his knee to no pope or to no system or to no man. And none of the Israelites in here are either. That's just the way it is. You know, people hate tough talk like that, man, because they don't, you know, they, they, they think that as soon as you put something up in front of them, that's going to cause them to shriek back and shrug back, that you don't really mean what you say. It's easy to talk tough. 
you know, when the fire's not on you. Amen. You understand what I mean? Yes, sir. What about when, when the situation gets in front of you then? Uh-huh. Yes, sir. Yes, ma'am. That's why I admonish you to let these words sink in your heart. I admonish you to study this word right here, to get this book, to know, to know your ancient people, because we're no different. Just make sure you're the righteous ones. Hallelujah. Well, because they had separated themselves from the people of the lands, look at this, doing according to their abominations, even the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Prebisites, the Jebusites, the Amorites, the Moabites, and the Egyptians and the Am Amorites. And they have taken for taken of their daughters for themselves and for their sons so that the holy seed is mingled have mingled themselves with the people of those lands yea the hand of the princes and the rulers have been cheap in this trespass you know the reason why the people do it right because the leaders the ones who's supposed to be the preachers the pastors the teachers all they're leading the way so they're emboldened to go do the same thing again well they doing it then why come we can't do it Hallelujah. See, the understanding is, is that since we know that we are the part of the dispersed, scattered throughout all these lands and stuff, and that he has called us out of this. In other words, when he called us out, it means he separated us from the heathens of his land. He separated us for a particular use, for us to be holy, because he holy. Not to continue on and act like these people still keep acting today. Not to bring that stuff over there, where you come from, over to here. Oh, hallelujah. Amen. Glory to the king. Amen. And it's sad when you got the preachers leading the charge and leading the way. The people see the, the, the leadership doing it, they're going to say, hey, good for them, God be good for me. Verse 3, and when I heard this thing, look what Ezra said. I rent my garment and my mantle and plucked off the hair of my head and of my beard and set down a star. Isn't that something? Then were assembled unto me everyone that trembled at the words of Yahweh. Everybody didn't come. He, he's very specific right here. He said everyone didn't come. He says, I'll read it again, verse 4. Then were assembled unto me everyone that trembled at the words of Yahweh. Y'all hearing this? Of Israel. Because of the transgression of those that had been carried away. And I said, astonished even unto the evening sacrifice. See, th this is the illusion right here. See, America wants you to think that we're all one people. Amen. That's what they want you to think. They want you to think that we're all one nation. And yet and still the book, and the, if you're a student of the history, lets you know that even in this scattering, in this dispersion right here, when we come out, we're not the same as the people we come out from. Because he who is holy has given us his ruah and chosen us out of this. So we're not the same as those people. There was a time we did look like them. We acted like them. We walked to the same excess of rioting as they did. Yes, we did. Now we are different. Now we are the set apart. And what he's done is he's, he, he's hey, he knows who his seed is. And he knows those that are his. And how he knows because he gives you his ruah. He gives you his spirit. He gives you the spirit to even follow Torah. To even love his law. These people don't love his law. These people don't love his Torah. No, they don't. And if they say they have the spirit and yet they don't love his word, then they have yeah, they got a spirit, a wicked one. Does that make any sense? Because the one thing that he did promise, it's amazing. For the 20-something years that I have been serving him, every single year he is still leading me and he is still guiding me into all truth. And once that leading and guiding, if it ever stops, you can go ahead and pronounce Ichabod on you because there's no more glory there. Hallelujah. And this is the truth. Let's listen to see what happened right here. Verse 5. And at the evening sacrifice, I rose from my heaviness, and having rent my garment and my mantle, and fell upon my knees, and spread out my hands unto Yahweh Elohim, and said, O oh my El, I am a shame and blush. To lift up my face to thee, 
my Yahweh. Isn't that something? For our iniquities are increased over our head, and our trespass is gone, grown up unto the heavens. Since the days of our fathers, we have been in a great trespass until this day. And for our iniquities, we have, uh, have we, our kings and our priests, been delivered into the hands of the kings of the land by the sword to captivity and to spoil and to confusion of face as it is this day. Tell me we don't fit this bill. And now for a little space, grace have been showed from Yahweh Elohim to leave us a remnant to escape and to give us a nail in his holy place that our master might lighten our eyes and give us a little reviving in our bondage. Is that not what he did when he gave us his ruah? He's yeah. lighten our eyes and give us a little reviving in this bondage. Well, if he didn't do it for you, he's done it for me. For we were bondmen. Isn't that something how he is not letting them forget their condition? And you tell me we're not in this same exile, in this same captivity. Strangers from our land right now. Yet our Elohim have not forsaken us in our bondage, but have extended mercy unto us in the sight of the kings of Persia to give us a reviving and to set up the house of our Yah and to repair the desolations thereof and to give us a wall in Judah and in Jerusalem. And now, O our Yah, what shall we say after this? For we have forsaken thy commandments, which thou hast commanded to be thy servant, uh, thy prophets, saying, The land unto which ye go into possess it, it is an unclean land with the filthiness of the people of the lands, with their abominations, which have filled it from one end to another with their uncleanliness. Is that not America? Is that not America? Do y'all love this country that much you can't testify against it? Now therefore give not your daughters unto their sons, neither take their daughters unto your sons, nor seek their peace, or their wealth forever that ye may be strong and eat the good of the land and leave it for an inheritance to your children forever. How many times I often talk about this little small community that I, I say that it is the lot has done fell in our hands, 40, 50 year old men, to prepare a place for who? The children. Hallelujah. And you better hope your children is righteous because if I'm still living, they wicked, they getting out of here too. And I don't care what you think. Hallelujah. We're not going to set a wicked man to tap the kingdom or a wicked woman. Oh, hallelujah. How would you like to sit up here and say we done um, had all this blood, sweat, and tears and then by the time we get 70, a wicked ruler come up and kick all those old people out? Huh? Hey, it happened before. Is there anything new under the sun? Oh, okay. Verse 13. And after all that has come upon us for our evil deeds and for our great trespass, seeing that our Yah has punished us less than our iniquities deserve. Is that not the truth? And has given us such deliverance as this. Should we again break thy commandments and join in infamity with the people of of these abominations, these Christians, out here, and all their abominations. That's what really makes this land filthy right here, is to say you have a license to commit idolatry and to break his commandments. Wouldst thou not be angry with us till thou hast consumed us so that there should be no remnant nor escaping? And Yahweh thy Elohim of Israel, thou art righteous. For we remain yet escaped as it is this day. Behold, we are before thee in our trespasses. For we cannot stand before thee because of this. Isn't that something? Now this is the way Ezra talked. He saw the condition of the people. 
He knew the shape that they were in. Am I making any sense? And what I see when I go all across this land, I see a people who don't know how wicked they are. They justify themselves, even in iniquity. It's a sad condition, sad state. Let's go to Nehemiah, the ninth chapter. Now in the twenty and fourth day of this month, the children of Israel were assembled with fasting and sackcloths upon the earth. And the seed of Israel separated themselves from all strangers and stood and confessed their sins and, their, and the iniquities of their fathers. Did y'all hear what the seed did? How many times we talk about when you're getting down to business about confessing sins and iniquities, you need to go back to your, you need to get you first, then you get on back to your fathers. Hallelujah. Because you act the way you act because the residue of your fathers is on you. It's been passed down by your wicked bloodline. Our people had sense back then, but these things have been forgotten. Have you forgotten you come out of Christianity which teach you that the Torah is done away with? Have you forgotten that that residue is still in your mind? That's the reason why you hate reading the book. Are we making any sense? That's why we don't pay attention to it. Because they have food and toyed around with our conscience. They have shaped us and molded us very good in this society to discount his holy word. Verse 3, and they stood up in their place and read the book, read in the book of the law of the Yahweh Elohim, one fourth part of the day and another fourth part they confessed and worshiped Yahweh Elohim. Isn't that not something? They would read the book. Are you following me? And then they would turn around and confess iniquities and then they would turn around and worship hallelujah then stood up on the stairs of the levites jezron and bani and kadidim and shebaniah and benu and shebaniah and shebariah beniah and shelling i think i got that name right shenaniah boy all of them naya isn't it and cried with a loud voice unto yahweh elohim then the levites and jezron and kemadel beniah Hazabaniah, uh, Sheribaniah, uh, Hobadiah, uh, Shebaniah, and Peth Hanhiah uh, said, Stand up and bless Yahweh your God forever and ever, and blessed be thy glorious name, which is exalted above all blessings and praise. Can y'all imagine telling someone to stand up, all the people, and bless him and stuff? Huh? How many times we do that during worship service in here where you got to literally pump because they're so hard. They're so full of themselves. That ain't the way that I, oh, I know exactly how you are. You're a disobedient, wicked person. You have no control over your own volition. Uh-oh. The one thing that he does do when he gives us his ruah, he, he gives us freedom to worship and you don't care who around you don't have no dignity when it comes time to be a true worshiper he does seek true worshipers well I don't worship the way you do I ain't never seen your form of worship in this book right here I seen lift up your voice I seen clap your hands I seen dance I seen sing and shout and I, oh, I seen, I've seen all that in the Psalms I haven't seen this golf clapping, docile, dormant, and stupid, apathetic, demoralized, wicked Christian spirit we learned from America, though, where you all reserved and preserved. Ain't I telling the truth, Israel? Oh, hallelujah. Y'all hear me out there, Israel? Get out of your wicked American ways. I, 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 just, I don't feel like, I don't want to be forced, so you're forced to be apathetic then. You're forced to be a statue. All right. Verse 6, thou, even thou art Lord alone, and thou hast made the heavens and the heavens of heavens with all their host and the earth and all things that are therein and the seas all that is therein and thou preservest them all of the host of heaven worship 
thee. All the hosts of heaven worship him, and yet we can't. Hmm? What do you think their focus and attention is right now? Is it on them or is it on him? Thou art master, y'all, that did us choose Abram and brought us him forth out of Ur of the Chaldeans and gave us him the name of Abraham and found us his heart faithful before thee and made us a covenant with him to give the land of the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Amorites, the Prebisites, the Jebusites, and the Gergesites to whom gave it. I say, to his seed, and has performed thy words, for thou art righteous, and did see the affliction of our fathers in Egypt, and heard us their cry by the Red Sea. You know what they're doing? You know what they're doing? They're, 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 they're in this prayer right now, this intercession, and they're reminding him of how good that he has been to us since so many of us have forgotten. And in America, most of you hadn't even forgotten. You don't even know the story. But you sure do know Christmas. You can tell me how Rudolph has a red nose. I guarantee you can tell me that. I guarantee you, you can sing the songs of Rome. Silent night. Holy night. Huh? But can't sing Psalms 3. The songs of Zion. We get some spick and span on here tonight, Alan. We need it. We do need it, Israel. Verse 10, it shows the signs and wonders upon Pharaoh and all of his servants and, and on all the people of his land. For thou knewest that they dealt proudly against them. So did us get the, uh, a name as it is to this day. So he goes all the way down. And, you, and I want y'all to finish reading the whole chapter and stuff. All he did was just testify how good he was. Are right, you following me? He testified how, how really, 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 really good he was. And then we'll go to Daniel, the ninth chapter. We'll read a little bit about Daniel, the ninth chapter, okay? And I'm going to start at verse 4, okay? And I prayed unto Yahweh. Now, what we're going to do is going to pay a particular attention how Daniel prayed too. So, so we got Abraham, we got Ezra, we got Nehemiah, now we're going to Daniel. Remember to read all of Nehemiah, the, the ninth chapter, okay? Hallelujah. Because there's some, you know, there's a couple of points in here that I wanted to hit, but I know if I get on them, I'll stay on them for a while. So y'all make sure y'all read them, okay? Hallelujah. Daniel 9, 4. And I prayed unto Yahweh, my Yah, and made my confession and said, O Yahweh, thy great and dreadful Yah, keeping covenant and mercy with them that love him and to them that keep his commandments. We have sinned and we have committed iniquity and we have done wickedly and have rebelled even by departing from thy precepts and from thy judgments. Neither have we hearkened unto the servants of thy prophets which spake in thy name to our kings. We ain't even listened to the pastors today who really truly mean business. They weren't hearkening to the prophets and Jeremiah told you that he was going to give you pastors according to his heart which shall feed you with knowledge and understanding. And we don't even hearken to that. Ain't I telling the truth, Israel? Our princes and our fathers and to all the people of the land. O master, righteous and belong unto thee, but unto us confusion of faces as it is this day. To the men of Judah and to the inhabitants of Judah, Jerusalem and unto all Israel that are near and that are afar off. The ones that are what? Near and the ones that are way off, right? Throughout all the countries, whether thou hast driven them because of their trespass, that they have trespassed against thee. You see the reason why we out our land? Huh? You see? Because of our iniquity. Our, our literal trespass against the king. And you have to understand, after many years of assimilation here in America, don't you think one minute that there's something in you that really want to get back there? That's why the pronunciation is woe unto them that are ease in Zion. Well, we ain't in Zion. You're Zion. You're the temple of the Holy Spirit. 
Oh, yeah, you are. Oh, I, I, see, I know the record right here. Ezra called the people to go to, to Jerusalem to go do the work. And ain't many people going to do that now. And as Americans, work, huh? You know, right? Amen. Hallelujah. Verse 8. O Lord, to us belong his confusion of faces, to our kings, to our princes, and to our fathers, because we have sinned against thee. And to Yahweh Elohim belong in mercies and forgiveness, though we have rebelled against him. These men knew how to pray. These men knew how to talk right. Neither have we obeyed the voice of Yahweh Elohim to walk in his laws, which he has set before us by his servants, the prophets. Yea, and all Israel have trespassed, have trans, excuse me, yea, and all Israel have transgressed thy law, even by departing that they might not obey thy voice. Y'all hear, y'all see the sole reason why people leave this way? Because they don't want to obey him. They got other ideals. Therefore the curse is poured upon us. And the oath that is written in the law of Moses. The servant of Yah. Because we have sinned against him. And he have confirmed his words. Which he spake against us. And against our judges. That judge us. By bringing upon us a great evil. For under the whole heaven. Have not been done as had been done upon Jerusalem. As it is written in the law of Moses, for all this evil has come upon us, yet we made not our prayer before Yahweh Elohim, that we might turn from our iniquities and understand thy truth. Look how many people is really interested in understanding this truth. Look how many people today is really interested in fashioning their whole lives after his truth. I see it even amongst us. How many people are disinterested in his ways. Therefore have Yahweh stretched, therefore have Yahweh watched upon the evil and brought it upon us. For Yahweh, our Elohim, our Yah is righteous in all his works which he doeth. For we obeyed not his voice. Is that not true? And now, O Yah, O Lord, our Yah. Thou hast brought thy people forth out of the land of Mizraim with a mighty hand and has gotten thee renowned as at this day we have sinned, we have done wickedly. Why is it that when we pray, these, these words never even enter in our minds? You ever notice that? Take an assessment of your own personal prayer life and see, if you, it, see how many times you actually grieve for the condition of your people. See, there's one, one thing we can learn from the prophets right here. They understood when the people were out of order. They didn't try to dress it up and make it look like everything was fine when it really truly wasn't. They wanted to get in touch with him and they wanted to get an answer for him and they knew how to approach him. And if you're going to be very serious about prayer, you need to know how to approach your Yahweh. Because you can't be coming with this mindset that we've been coming with. Over these last decades and centuries. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. You got to come with a sincere heart. Verse 16. O Lord according to all thy righteousness I beseech thee. Let thy anger and thy fury be turned away from the city of Jerusalem. Thy holy mountain because of our sins. And for the iniquities of our fathers. Jerusalem and our people are become a reproach to all that are about us. Now you know. You know. We're reproached now because we've come out. We experienced the reproach. Y'all don't notice that? Y'all don't notice how we're peculiar and people just stare us down, look at us crazy? Because we're reproached, we'll come out, right? Oh, well, you should be happy, right? Oh, well, hallelujah. But what are your reproach to? The heathen? Who cares? Hallelujah. I don't. One bit. But we are so arrogant today that we're not even asking the Father. To turn his anger away from us. Why does the father need to turn his anger away from us? We ain't doing nothing. 
That's why. Because we ain't doing nothing too much. Do y'all see the zeal and the fervency? Do you see the example that is set before our eyes of how these men prayed? First, they humbled themselves. Is that not what the prophet say? If my people which are called by my name will do what? Humble themselves and do what? Pray and do what? Seek his face. Then would we hear from heaven. Is that right? But before we do that, we got to turn from our what? Wicked ways. Then would we hear from heaven. Isn't that right? Then he would heal our land. Would he not? Yes, yeah, sure. But there's a big if. See, I understand the plight of us, brothers and sisters. We grew up here in America. And we're far from this thought pattern. Amen. That's true. That's true. Yes, we are. I just choose to not ignore that fact. I know if I have the challenges that challenge my mind and stuff, then it's got to be challenging all the saints. I just choose to not ignore it. But I know to be right with him, you have to spurn and hate everything that is not of him. That I know. And I think it's time since we are at the end of this thing for us to give him his due. I think it's time for us to be sober minded. Are y'all there? Yes, sir. Y'all all right? Yes, sir. Good. We want to give an example of what it even takes to begin to intercede for someone. Even yourselves. You see the reason why they don't talk too much about repentance in this land? Y'all don't see that? People ain't interested in it. Y'all getting this? Ain't nobody interested in no repentance. A repentance is a cuss word in this land. Because that means you have to acknowledge that you are wrong. You've done something wrong. And the biggest thing is putting everything before him. Let's go to verse 17. Now therefore, y'all, hear the prayer of thy servant and the supplications and cause thy face to shine upon thy sanctuary that is desolate for the master's sake. O my Yahweh, incline thy ear and hear. Open thine eyes and behold our desolations in the city which is called by thy name. For we do not present our supplication before thee for our righteousness but for thy great mercies. O master, hear. O master, forgive. O master, hearken and do. Defer not for thy own sake. O my Yah, for thy city and thy people are called by thy name. See how now they're they're, they're presenting themselves to him. They're dependent all solely, totally upon his promises. What's amazing about us we can go out and live like live wicked as hell, do wicked as hell, and, and just stack this stuff all up, and then we expect him to all of a sudden just turn mercy on just like that. How about just stay away from wickedness? So he can be happy for once in his 7,000 years. Hallelujah. How about that? How about we live in such a manner, such a way that he can have a smile on his face? Why did he give us his Holy Spirit? For that sole reason. So that he could have a people... Believe it or not, we live in a generation now where people are even tired of the Holy Spirit. I kid you not. I kid you not. You tell me you have the Holy Spirit, I automatically assume you want to be holy. Because that's what His Spirit does. His Spirit, man, it puts a yearning in you to want to be holy. Watch all this excuse making you come up with. Hmm? Uh oh. Glory to the king. What did Brother Charles say down there? He told me after Shabbat, when I came in on the first day of priest, he told me before I left Shabbat, he said, turn it up a little more. I hope Brother Charles is listening. I hope he did. And when I turned it up a little more, Brother Charles got quieter. I said, now wait a minute, Brother Charles. You told me to turn it up a little more. And I did. And you getting quiet. You all right? <laughs> beautiful old man, wasn't he? He's a beautiful old man. 
That old man danced all around that place, boy. <laughs> Hallelujah. Verse 20. And whilst I was speaking and praying and confessing my sin. No, oh, oh, Daniel's confessing whose sin? His. First, okay. And the sin of my people Israel. And presenting my supplication before Yahweh Elohim for the holy mountain of my, Elo, my Yah. Yea, whilst I was speaking in prayer, even the man, Gabriel, whom I had seen in the vision at the beginning, being caused to fire swiftly, touched me about the time of the even oblation. And he informed me and talked with me and said, O Daniel, I am come forth to give thee, look at this, skill and understanding. That is, you know, every good gift comes from the Father. If a man has skill, he has understanding. It didn't come because he just conjured it up himself. The Father gave it to him. And at the beginning of thy supplication, the commandment came forth, and I came to show thee, for thou art greatly beloved. If you had been in this prayer all this time, Daniel, and you finally been sitting there, notice, how many days was he praying? We know. 21 days. So that means he didn't stop. Isn't that something? He kept on and on and on and on and on praying and asked the same thing over and over and over and over again. We pray one time, okay. We learned that from Christianity. But our people kept on praying. Huh? I would love to hear the words, you're greatly beloved. That means we won't pull another 21. <laughs> Hearing that from Gabriel? Therefore, understand the matter and consider the vision. Keys, I want you to listen to the keys in this, the keys in the prayer, so you know what's going on. Let's go to um, Daniel 10, 12. Then said he unto me, Fear not, Daniel, for from the first time that thou didst set thine heart to understand. Notice, this is from the first time you set your heart to understand. Have you ever done something for the Most High and you had already purposed in your heart and you set your heart? Huh? Listen to what the angel said. Listen to what Gabriel said. And to chasten thyself before Yahweh. Chasten, yeah, that means in sackcloth and, and fastings and prayers. And Look what he said. Thy words were heard, and I am come for thy words. It just took 21 days for them to manifest. Did y'all hear what I said? He said, from the first time you set your heart to understand and to chasten yourself. That's how I know. That's how I know that when the church or the assembly really truly gets serious, we can have these, these um, gifts of the Spirit. Yeah, when the heart is right. Mm -hmm. When you set your heart really true to understand. Uh-oh. You know, it'd be something else, man. If I was at, okay, I, I'd probably get more response if I said we're going to have a, a, a beef weenie roast. Now I'm talking about stuff that's going to enhance the body right here. If we were already doing this, I wouldn't have to talk about this. Isn't that the truth? Yes, sir. Amen. Then we could talk about a beef when he roast. <laughs> but I want all of y'all right now. Yeah. Hallelujah. Look at what he says, though. See, this is how the Torah, the Tanakh, the prophets, they always give us insight of what's going on in the spiritual realm that we can't see. Like Job did. He gave us a lot of insight, didn't he? Huh? Look, look, look at him. But the prince of the kingdom of Persia withstood me one and twenty days. But lo, Michael, one of the chief princes, came to help me. And I remain there with the kings of Persia. So, understand this. Persia was also ruling. Understand this. There's a demonic spirit 
that is over every king of this earth. Now y'all listening to me. To prove my point. Verse 14. Now I am come to make thee to understand what shall befall thy people in the latter days. For yet the vision is for many days. Listen. Verse 19. You ready? And said, O man greatly beloved, fear not. Peace be unto thee. Be strong. Yea, be strong. And when he had spoken unto me, I was strengthened and said, Let my Lord speak, for thou hast strengthened me. Verse 20. Then he said, look at this. Knowest thou wherefore I am come unto thee? Do you know the reason why I am come unto thee? Listen. And now I will return to fight with the prince of Persia. Now wait a minute. I thought the prince of Persia would have been the king. No, he's talking about another prince of Persia. That is over that wicked kingdom. And when I am gone forth, lo, the prince of Grecia shall come. That's when the Greek came in and ruled. Because they had that ruling demonic spirit. Just like the Romans does. Just like the Arabs does. Just like the Europeans does. And definitely America does. There's a spirit that is ruling over this wicked country. Y'all don't see the language right there? I want y'all to please read 2 Kings, the 19th chapter, verse 14 through 37. All right? Y'all know that the Most High spared Hezekiah, right? Hezekiah wanted everyone to know that the Most High fought his battle for him. The lesson learned, if we make our request the same way unto him, Yahweh will be glorified and our prayers will become more effective. I'll read 2 Kings 19, 35. And it came to pass that night that the angel of Yahweh went out and smote in the camp of the Assyrians, a hundred and four score and five thousand. And when they arose early in the morning, behold, they were all dead corpse. When, can you imagine what kind of power that we would have? We would all just pray together in unity against anybody that's trying to destroy us. You know America hates us. You know Christianity does. Wouldn't it be nice if we could have that kind of unity in prayer? I'm going to run through some scriptures here right here to show you something real quick. Look at what Yahweh did, okay? And this is the reason why you need to learn how the Bible prays. Moses prayed because of the rebellion of his people. Exodus 15, verses 24 and 25. Did he not pray because of the rebellion of, of Yah's people? All right. Y'all remember that, that woman named Hannah? She interceded for a son, didn't she? Did she not intercede for a son? Fervent prayer. They, the priest thought there was something wrong with her. Thought she was drunk. She was praying from the heart. First Samuel. First chapter, verses 9 through 18. Hezekiah interceded for his life. 2 Kings chapter 20 verses 1 through 5. Jehoshaphat saved his life through a cry of prayer in 2 Chronicles 18.31. And Zechariah interceded for the child in Luke 1.13. Hallelujah. Now, prayer, anytime you make a request, should be without ceasing. Forget this one time done it, and if you ask anymore, you don't have faith. That's the devil's doctrine. That don't fit our book. Hallelujah. And to prove it, I want y'all to read Luke, the 18th chapter, verses 1 through 8. All right? Luke, the 18th chapter, verses 1 through 8. You hear about this woman who kept on coming and wouldn't stop. Hallelujah. And prayer is not a hope to receive. It is an expecting. You are expected to receive. Hallelujah. Let me read you Hebrews 6, 12. That you be not slothful. What, be, be not what? That you be not what? But followers of them who through faith and patience 
inherit the promises. So you need patience. Look how long it took for Daniel to get his prayer to answer. Huh? They received because they patiently waited for the answer. Hallelujah. No, no, something that Americans ain't got. We're running pretty short on patience. Hallelujah. Isn't that true? Let me, show, let me read another one in Hebrews. Hebrews 6.15. Listen to this. So and so, after he had patiently endured. What kind of talk is that, brother? Patiently endured. Yeah, patiently wait. Huh? He obtained the promise. But they were doing something while they were waiting. Did Daniel stop praying? No. Oh, okay. So should you stop praying? No. And when you read Luke 1, 18, Luke, Luke 18, verses 1 through 8, you're going to see this woman didn't stop either until her request. You know, it's amazing because the Most High basically is just telling us, get on his nerves. I mean, he ain't hard to hear and he hear you. But you know, he do have our universe to run. <laughs> Hallelujah. First Thessalonians 5, 17. Pray without ceasing. Pray without what? That's totally different from modern Christianity doctrine, isn't it? Pray without what? Don't get me wrong. You do need to make your request known to the Father, but you don't need to do it for selfish reasons. You need to do it because you want your lifestyle to, to glorify Him. And that whole perspective and point of view is, is worth it all. Maybe a lasting change would take place too. Huh? 2 Timothy 1 3. I thank Yah, whom I serve from my forefathers with pure consciousness that without ceasing that without ceasing that without ceasing y'all hearing this Israel? that without ceasing I have remembrance of thee in my prayers night and day what, 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 what? you mean tell me every night and every day he's praying for this for the, this is Paul praying for, the, for Timothy Paul wanted Timothy to be a strapped man of y'all. So he kept on praying for him. So what do you learn about this? If you're praying for someone, be persistent. Because people do fall off the deep end, right? Some people just ain't right. And you would love to have them saved, wouldn't you? Well, just be persistent. Let the most high do it. If I'm praying for someone and I, and I really want them to come to the Father, I, I pray, Father, make their life miserable. Turn them upside down. Make them beg on their knees. You know how we pray as Americans. Father, I pray that you save them. They good. They my child. They ain't never work for me. I pray that you make their life miserable. Hallelujah. Who would pray something like that? Well, the same one that says he's going to turn somebody over to Satan for the destruction of their flesh, that their spirit and soul may be saved in the coming of the day of the Lord. Wow. Isn't that beautiful? That's a whole paradigm shift, isn't it? I don't wish no man to be damned. I don't. I really truly don't. My enemies, I don't care two dead flies about them. Everyone, and now don't get me wrong, as parents, see children don't understand what it means to be a parent because they're not a parent. But as parents, you want your children saved. Yeah, yes, you do. You really truly do. So just keep praying for them, but just don't submit to their wickedness. Hallelujah. 
And I just gave you the way to pray for them. Father, turn the world upside down. Make them miserable. I don't want them miserable. Oh, you want them to have fun and they see it then. And the boy, they'll really come running in, won't they? <laughs> I don't know about it. Luke 2, 37. And she was a widow for about four score and four years, which departed not from the temple, but served Yah with fastings and prayers night and day. I guarantee you, every time she opened her mouth, the father heard her. You know why? Because there was a sacrifice involved. Let me see, what's that song we sing? We bring sacrifice of praise. Oh, okay, all right. First Timothy 5, 5. Now she that is a widow indeed and desolate trusteth in Yah and continueth in supplications and prayers night and day. See what widow's supposed to be doing? We just ain't supposed to be going around having gospel, gossip and slander fest, talking on the helophone and everything and passing out all kind of, you get, get, get on your knees. Help Israel out because we sure need it. See, that's cuss words nowadays. Told me so foolish. I'm talking about widows right here. Colossians 1.3. We give thanks to Yah and our Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, praying always for you. Y'all see, we get all these scriptures about how consistent and persistent we need to be. Verse 4 Since we heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and of the love which ye have to all of the saints. Boy, you mean to have love of the saints you're actually praying for them too? Huh? We heard your work that you're doing, knowing that you love the saints. That's the only way you can show you you love the saints is, is to buy the work that you do. So I see brothers running around dragging jobs down, ain't got nothing else to do, disappearing and stuff. I know what your love is. Every single time I know what your love is. Oh, hallelujah. Sisters too. In army, we used to call it ghosting. You know what ghost is, right? You can't see it. What is the wrong kind of prayer? Back over to Luke 18, verses 9 through 14. I'm going to read that real quick. And he spake a parable unto certain which trusted in themselves that they were righteous and despised others. This is the wrong kind of spirit to have. Well, you think you're righteous and that righteous causes you to despise somebody else. Ooh, ooh. Y'all hearing that? Look at this. Two men went up to the temple to pray, and one a Pharisee and another publican. The Pharisee, the Pharisee stood and prayed thus within himself, Yah, I thank thee that I am not as other men are, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even as this publican over here. I fast twice a week, and I give tithes of all I possess. And the publican standing afar off would not so much as lift up so much as his eyes unto heaven. That sounds like uh, Ezra. He was ashamed and said astonished. Huh? But smote upon his breast saying, Y'all have mercy or y'all be merciful to me, a sinner. Good way to get the father's attention in. Huh? I tell you that this man went down to his house justified rather than the other. For every one that exalted himself shall be abased, and he that humbled himself shall be exalted. So don't be despising nobody. Hallelujah. You know, a lot of people, you remember Paul said, that I, I boast in the regions of Achaia. You remember he talked about all the boasting. He was boasting about what, what the Most High is doing. 
And of course, then a lot of people take that boasting as if he was boasting of himself when he clearly told you what he was boasting of. See, you have to take heed how you hear. Luke 17, 10. So likewise ye, when ye have, uh, when ye shall have done all those things which are commanded you, say, we are unprofitable servants. And we have done that which was our duty to do. We get finished with it all. All right? So I hope that you learned something here tonight. I know it, hey, it's coming out the gate pretty hard, isn't it? No, huh? no, it ain't. It's just a bunch of direction. That's all it is. The most high love us. That's all it is. If it's hard, it's because you got transgression in you. How can uh, feeding you with knowledge of the understanding of the true way, the way to get a hold of the most high, the way to get a prayer's answers be hard? It's the way you say it. No, it's how you hear. That's the problem. Glory to the king. But I hope that some way that you learn how did um, we need to start actually directing the very energy of our prayers. Hallelujah. You got to repent, saints. You got to gotta make sure that you're right and you're in a stead. And then you need to be persistent. And then you need to patiently wait while you're persistent. Hallelujah. Glory to the king. Hallelujah. Heavenly Father, we thank you for these sayings. We hope that they sink deep down in our hearts, that we take it to heart and actually let it become part of our lifestyles and that we would use the words here tonight to be the inception and the start of us really, truly wanting to be close to you, to, to bring edification to the body um, of Christ, that we all, until we all, come to the union of the faith. We thank you for all things in the mighty name of Jesus. Bless all the saints out there in the internet land that are watching on this scripture study. We'll give you glory for all things. Amen. Bless y'all. Shalom.